As we approach the two-year mark of the date that the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic originated tonight, we do celebrate some encouraging news in the United States. As an international travel ban has been lifted for vaccinated individuals in 33 countries. But although headway has been made, it's still not clear how and when we will finally see an end to pandemic life. Good evening and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us tonight, as always, is world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And later on, tonight's special guest is the Chair of Pathology and Microbiology at UNMC, Dr. Stephen Henricks. He's going to join our conversation to talk about the occurrence of COVID-19 in animals. And you at home are a big part of our show. In just a few moments, we will open up our phone lines and give you an opportunity to ask your questions about the virus. I want to give you that number now, though. 877-731-6733 is the number to call in with your questions or comments. But first, Dr. Gold, let's start with the latest data. What does it reveal about the global pandemic? How widespread is COVID-19 at this hour? You know, Christina, as we bring up the first of our graphics tonight, you may recall the last several weeks, a tone of optimism, a tone of falling numbers globally and across the United States. And as our charts will show tonight, it does appear that we've at least temporarily hit a plateau, if not a slight increase. So this would be our global numbers. So you see we're just under 250 million confirmed cases Uh, worldwide, another 44,000 yesterday. But if you look at the last several weeks at that seven-day running average, you see that the numbers uh, unescapably are starting to rise. Interestingly, not only in the United States, but predominantly in Western Europe and other parts of the world. Because as we look at the global map, you can see that the United States uh, is still deeply colored uh, amber, uh, but the brightest red uh, and the deepest purples are in Western and Eastern Europe uh, now. And those numbers continue to rise in spite of a very rigorous vaccine uh, utilization, uh, raising some of the questions about breakthrough, some of the questions about boosters uh, and others. Because we have typically been three to four weeks behind what's been going on in Western Europe. Uh, When you look at the new case trends uh, in the United States, and this is the last 90 days, we'll look more detail back to the beginning of the pandemic in just a minute. You see that seven-day rolling average is, you know, when the best of cases over the last week or 10 days flat and possibly slightly rising. And we'll look at some of those numbers uh, here. If you look at our map, uh, you can see that the uh, mid-mountain west, uh, the southwest part of the country, and now parts of the uh, Great Lakes region. Uh, You know, look at the upper peninsula of Michigan and uh, Some of the areas uh, in Ohio, Pennsylvania, western New York are are starting to show deeper colors of orange and red, a pattern very similar to what we saw almost exactly a year ago as the weather got colder and we got closer uh, to the winter holidays. When we look at some of these uh, numbers of uh, coronavirus cases uh, per state, per 100,000 per day, uh, you can see with a U.S. average of approximately 22 to cases. Uh, Alaska is still almost four times that. North Dakota, uh, Montana, and Wyoming, approximately three times that. Colorado. Uh, and as we can tell from previous weeks that we've talked about this, these numbers are still extremely high, although slightly lower uh, than they were last time that we spoke about it together. If we look at the U.S. cases uh, per 100,000 per day, you know, going back to the very beginning of the pandemic, I think the last several weeks shows us very much uh, what the expanded curve did, which is we're pretty much in a plateau now. We were coming down really nicely from the Delta variant surge of August and September, early October, uh, and you can see that we're now pretty flat, and it's unclear what the next several weeks are going to actually bring. When we look at some of the hospitalization data, again, Montana, North Dakota, West Virginia, Wyoming, uh, some of the highest uh, in the United States, much higher than we see in the eastern seaboard, the mid-Atlantic, and in the southeastern part uh, of the U.S. If we look at the distribution by variants, again, the United States is still almost 100% Delta variant uh, in all of the 10 uh, 
health and human services zones, uh, whether all the way from the uh, uh, northeastern part of our country to the far uh, northwest and every place in between. We are starting to see a bit more of the mu variant and the epsilon variant in other parts of the world, which do appear to be a bit more contagious and possibly a higher rate of vaccine breakthrough. So we're going to have to follow that closely, but that is not what is going on in the United States right now. We are still predominantly a Delta variant uh, nation, which is good news because it maintains our immunity uh, with the vaccines. Uh, this is a look at hospitalizations per day. And as you see, we have come down nicely uh, since the September, early October peak. But that, even that is starting to flatten out, particularly in the Great Plains uh, and in the Mountain West part of the United States. When we move on and we look at the death rates, uh, you can see that it mirrors uh, just what the case rates have looked like with Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, uh, and still uh, a bit of Alabama and uh, West Virginia uh, in some of these higher uh, deaths per 100,000 uh, per day. If we look at hospitalization, and this is intensive care unit utilization, you can see it again matches up to the case rate distribution uh, in the Mountain West, uh, particularly uh, moving rapidly towards the uh, uh, Pacific uh, Northwest part of the country, with still some smatterings <clears throat> widely across, uh, you know, my home state of Nebraska, Kansas, uh, Iowa, Montana, uh, and also uh, in the Great Lakes region are starting to pick up a bit in terms of our ICU utilization. And this, of course, is what's been happening to death, so the death rate is still falling in the United States, but it's, again, uh, wouldn't surprise me if we start to see a plateau, uh, particularly for those that are not vaxxed, those with comorbidities, uh, and those very unusual uh, co uh, morbidity cases uh, that are occurring with vaccine breakthrough. Now let's shift gears after we look at this slide just for a minute, and these are some of the very highest parts of the country, uh, whether it's in Alaska or West Virginia, uh, whether it's in Montana or Michigan. You can see with a U.S. average of 22 cases per 100,000 per day, uh, some of these areas are between 8, 10, 15 times higher. So these are small rural communities, small numbers of cases, but very high case rate growth. Again, reinforcing the fact that COVID is still very much both a rural and an urban uh, disease. It's still very much a disease of our farming and ranching communities across the, the U.S. Now let's shift gears now and talk about vaccines, all ages, uh, down to five, 58 percent fully vaxxed. 12 and up, 68% fully vaxxed. Those that are 65 and older, 86% fully vaxxed. 98%, almost 100% of those 65 and older have had at least one shot. And that's a really good sign now because these are the most vulnerable individuals uh, across our country. We look at the number of vaccinations per day. We're up to 1.28 million. A lot of that, of course, is booster doses, and we'll dissect that in just a second. Uh, here on some of these future graphics. When we look at the predictions, 67%, uh, 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 you know, we've already passed. That's where we're sitting uh, right now, and this is for all uh, age groups. Uh, but 94%, not until next September 11th, almost uh, a year from now at this current rate. And that has to do uh, with those that are getting their first doses. We're doing a really good job with booster doses, of course, but those are the vaccine willing that those were willing to roll up their sleeves early on and get their first doses of vaccine. So it's not surprising that they're also willing to roll up their sleeves and get their boosters. We're about to see what's going to happen with the kids. So let's talk about those boosters just for a minute. So uh, as of uh, yesterday, about 193 million Americans have been fully vaxxed. And about 21.5 million individuals have received a booster dose. So that's a pretty good rate, considering we've only been uh, using the Pfizer booster for about a month or six weeks, and only recently added the Moderna and the J&J &J boosters uh, to that mix. When we look at the distribution uh, across the country, uh, you can see that it mirrors 
the primary vaccine uh, distribution uh, rates in the various states across our country. But let's stay on this graphic for just a minute, Christina. So what this says is that of those individuals who received a a Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, 98.5% have chosen to get a Pfizer booster. For those that have gotten uh, Moderna, 95% uh, have thus far chosen to get, of those that have gotten a booster, have gotten Moderna. For those that started off with the virus vector vaccine, the J&J Janssen product, about a third uh, have gotten uh, the Pfizer booster, 45% have gotten the Moderna booster, and 20% got the J&J. And of those that we're not sure of what their first dose was, that is to say, before they got their booster, it looks like 73% so far have opted for Pfizer, about 25% for Moderna. So what this graphic tells us is that the overwhelming majority of individuals that now have a choice as to which booster to get are choosing to get the, uh, the mRNA vaccines of either the Pfizer or, or the Moderna. So back to you, and I look forward to our audience questions, and I very much look forward to bringing uh, Dr. Steve Henricks into our conversation later this evening. Absolutely. Really very curious about cases of COVID-19 in animals, and he's going to sort it all out for us as we go on throughout the night tonight, so we are excited about having him. And I do want to ask you a couple questions of my own before we start taking our audience calls tonight. Let's give you that number one more time, though. It's 877 731 6733. We're going to get it up on the screen for you there. Call in with your comments or your questions for Dr. Gold tonight, and he will answer them for you right here promptly. Now, after over 18 months of restrictions, an international travel ban has been lifted for vaccinated travelers in 33 countries just in time for the holidays. It's good news, but it's also a time when cold weather will bring people together indoors. What is your outlook for the next few months in the United States? You know, if we had this conversation two weeks ago, Christina, I think it would have been a lot more positive uh, than it is this evening. I think it's really premature to make a projection uh, for the winter holidays right now. And I say that because the rates of transmission in Western Europe, Eastern Europe, and other parts of the world that typically precede us between three and five weeks are actually going up and the virus transmission is getting difficult to control. If that is still going to be a predictor for the U.S., and, you know, we've just talked about the fact that we're, under the best of circumstances, at a case level, we're in a plateau mode, even though we should be doing better due to vaccine rates, booster rates, and other such things, uh, uh, it is concerning. And so I think the next several weeks is going to tell the tale. If we're where we are next week and two weeks uh, close to where we are today, uh, it's not going to be terribly open and a terribly uh, engaging winter holiday season. If this is just a blip and actually we see continued fall in caseloads and hospitalizations and a considerable uptick in vaccines, particularly now that five-year-olds and older, you know, can get vaccinated, critically important, by the way, not because of how sick they get, although they can get quite sick, but because that's a very, very fertile ground for the transmission of the virus, which is then brought home to the parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles, you know, and then the holiday gatherings, and before you know it, uh, trouble begins. So I think we're just going to have to see. Uh, You know, we'll, I'm sure, answer the same question again next week when we're together. And I'll just continue to give you the most transparent answer uh, that I can give you. But right now, my best guess is we don't know. I appreciate that. You're not going to raise false hopes and you're going to keep us safe in doing so as well. We still need to be wearing our masks out there wherever we go. Now, the antiviral drug made by Merck won authorization in the U.K. on Thursday. This is also very promising. And Pfizer announced now on Friday It, too, has a new antiviral drug that reduced the risk of hospitalization or death by 89 percent in a clinical trial. How excited should we be about these breakthroughs? Yeah, I'm very excited about it because uh, whether we're dealing uh, with an individual who has chosen not to be vaccinated for one reason or another, or we're dealing with an individual that's got a lot of comorbidities or older age who was vaxxed, Uh, who is either waiting for their booster or has had a breakthrough 
case, it appears from the clinical trial that if they're treated with these new drugs within the first uh, oh, two to three days of becoming symptomatic and having a positive test, uh, there is, as you said, an 89% chance of preventing hospitalization and death. You know, that's an, almost a 9 out of 10 chance. That's incredibly effective. And, you know, fortunately, uh, there will be a significant amount of this drug, these drugs, both of them hopefully available. The Merck drug is being reviewed by the Food and Drug Administration as we speak, and hopefully the Pfizer drug uh, in the very, very near future. Uh, and, you know, I'm guessing, uh, all things being equal for safety and efficacy, that if these statistics from the clinical trials are borne out, there will be an emergency use authorization, and physicians, clinics, healthcare professionals will be able to prescribe those drugs. And so that could go back to your earlier question, Christina, about what to expect for the holidays. Because if we can keep people out of the hospitals and keep families together, uh, you know, that, that's the, that is the solution that we're really looking for. Yeah, I'm hoping that both will be game changers when it comes to the pandemic. Two years after the fact, when you think about it, that's still a rapid pace to have these antivirals going into the testing phase. So it's pretty interesting to see where we're going to go from here. We've got our first question tonight from the phones. We're going to Roger of New York. Thanks for joining us, Roger. Go right ahead. Yes, hi. Um, first, I'd like to thank RFD TV and Dr. Gold. Um, for this show. It's uh, very informative. And uh, my question is, I'm 58 years old, fully vaccinated, and wondering if there's any studies or anything coming down the pipeline where the boosters will be available for my age group. Uh, Roger, well, first of all, thank you for your kind words and for calling from uh, New York. Uh, you know, the, the, the current studies show that in individuals younger than 65, and by the way, you should be thankful that you're younger than 65, uh, is that you maintain reasonable immunity. Now, obviously, over time, that will change. Whether When it changes to the point that you're no longer adequately protected, uh, that's when the recommendation uh, for the boosters for 50-year-olds, 40-year-olds, 30-year-olds uh, will become important. But if you remember, when we looked at the graphics of the vaccine advantage uh, for both cases uh, and for deaths compared to those that are not vaccinated, in your age group, there's still a very, very significant advantage, and that's without booster doses. And so, therefore, I would say, uh, you know, hold that thought. Uh, at some point, uh, we either through looking at case infection rates, so-called breakthrough rates, and most importantly, hospitalization rates, a recommendation will be made. And that will be brought forward, uh, you know, I would say that's probably going to be monitored on at least a month-by-month -month basis by both the FDA and the CDC. Thank you so much for that call. We appreciate it, Roger. We're going to go back to New York. This time, Bob has a question. Go right ahead, Bob. Yeah, I appreciate watching your show just the same. And uh, just like to know, is the third booster shot the same strength as the other two we got? So, uh, Bob, uh, the, there's a little bit of nuance to your question. So let me take it in stages. For Pfizer, the answer to the question is yes. It's a 30 microgram dose which is very different from the childhood dose, the 5 to 11-year-old, which is a third of that, 10 micrograms. So all the boosters uh, uh, for Pfizer are full dose. That is not the case of Moderna. The full dose Moderna is a 100 microgram dose, uh, and the booster is half of that. It's 50 micrograms. Uh, for J&J, &J, uh, uh, Janssen product, the virus vector vaccine, uh, I believe it is the same as the original. Now, the nuance, the, the twist to this is that if you fall in the category of being immunocompromised, you're being treated for cancer, you've had a solid organ transplant, you're on high-dose steroids or something else, instead of calling it a booster, we're calling it a third dose. And if, the, if you need a third dose for any reason, any medical reason, 
then that's the full dose for either Pfizer, Moderna, or J&J. So sorry if, uh, if it's a bit confusing, but I wanted to make sure that you got a full and accurate answer. Thank you for that call, Bob. We appreciate you. Next up is Momo from Ohio. Thanks for joining us, Momo. Go right ahead. Hello, Doctor. How are you? Good evening. Uh, my qu my question is about I'm 70, and I guess you call it com comorbid. I've had some heart issues, and I'm I'm afraid about the second vaccine, and and uh, and not not even thinking about the booster yet. Do you, do you have any ideas as to whether I should be worried or not? Well, unless you had, so I'm in, inferring from your question, Momo, that you got the first dose of either the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine, and your concerns are about the second dose and possibly a, a booster thereafter. First of all, the, the, the best answer to your question, if you have concerns, talk to your healthcare professional. Because if you have specific medical issues, uh, that's really where you're going to get the best advice. However, unless you've had a really bad reaction to the first dose, uh, we strongly recommend a follow-up for the uh, Moderna and the Pfizer. And then at the age of 70, at some point, six months down the line, uh, they're going to recommend uh, a booster for you for the Pfizer uh, uh, drug as well. But again, if you have concerns, uh, particularly if you had a bad reaction to the first dose of one of these drugs, uh, that's a really good reason to talk to your healthcare professional and, and get their advice. But all things being equal, uh, we would recommend uh, going ahead uh, with your second dose. There's a definite long-term benefit, not only in protection, but also in longevity of response. All right. Thank you for that call, Momo. We appreciate it. We are going to come back in just a moment. Jim from Montana, thank you for hanging on the line. You will get your question answered by world-renowned Dr. Gold right after this quick break. I want to make sure you at home have the number. It's 877-731-6733. Call in with your questions. And when we come back, the chair of pathology and microbiology at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, Dr. Stephen Henricks, will join the conversation. More Rural Health Matters right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And now we welcome our special guest, the Chair of Pathology and Microbiology at the UNMC campus. Dr. Stephen Henricks joins us. As a pathologist, he works behind the scenes, but his work ranges from the Nebraska Public Health Laboratory to the Nebraska Biocontainment Unit to connections with the Department of Defense and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. He's a very important man giving us his time tonight. Welcome and thank you for being with us, Dr. Henricks. Now, you're here to talk about COVID-19 in animals. Is this something our farmers and ranchers need to be concerned about? I would say that uh, for farmers and ranchers, it's something to be very much aware of. Um, but in fact, I know many of them are already, particularly if they have containment facilities. Uh, and the real issue is how many or what is the risk of them to their animals and then vice versa. And can you tell us a little bit more about that? What is the risk of contracting the virus from an animal or us giving it to them? Unfortunately, the, the latter is the more common thing right now. Um, and we've seen transmission from humans uh, to seven species of animals. Uh, fortunately, not so many uh, to uh, uh, hog farms, uh, et cetera, but uh, certainly to mink farming operations, uh, particularly in the Netherlands. Uh, they've been devastated by transmission from humans. And then now, in addition, we've uh, begun to see transmission into our zoo animals. Uh, particularly cats uh, and some uh, gorillas uh, on in our zoos in America. You know, some people at home might be looking across the room and Scruffy's over there. <laughs> They've got a cat right there looking back at them. Do we need to be concerned about our domesticated household pets? Well, I'm glad you brought up cats and dogs. Um, our experience so far is that we are not at significant risk uh, to infection from cats and or dogs. Uh, those don't seem to be a problem. In fact, it's although very difficult to even see illnesses from coronaviruses in cats, 
Uh, at the present time, we don't see a significant concern with domestic animals, but we do see them uh, with exotic animals and, uh, and some captive animals. Okay. I have heard reports recently as well of wild deer. And obviously, this is that time of year when the wild deer are coming out. We can see them here all over Nashville. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, so for uh, whatever reason, uh, we've seen a number of infections or evidence of infection in white-tailed deer. And uh, as this is now harvest time, um, a number of animals are being tested, and they're finding a surprising number of antibodies present in those animals that are uh, harvested this time of year. Wow, that's fascinating. Okay, a little bit later on, we're going to ask you about hunters and if they need to have any concern when it comes to handling harvested animals. But first, we want to go back to the phones. I promised Jim from Montana we would get to your question. Go right ahead, Jim. Yes, I'm curious as to why the sparsely uh, populated as we are, uh, I thought that the coronavirus are that anyway, it would not uh, be so bad here, and that it would be easier to, to control, but it seems like that's not the case at all. Well, unfortunately, Jim, uh, being sparsely populated with, uh, you know, or low population density, although helpful, <clears throat> it's not preventive. And that is because human beings are very social in nature, they like to gather in church and schools, at athletic events, concerts, and other such things. They like to have multi-generational family meetings. And with our kids being back at school, as we all know, uh, the, the younger the child, the more of a uh, factory for virus spread it turns out to be. And then they tend to bring those viruses home. And of course, not just COVID, but you know all types of uh, influenza viruses, and common cold viruses uh, and others. The difference that we're seeing now, of course, is that COVID is far more severe than the common cold or influenza, particularly now uh, with the Delta variant. And that, I think, is what is responsible, Jim, for very, very rural areas. I mean, you know, we've talked a bit about over the last several weeks what's going on in Alaska. You know, you talk about rural, uh, non-dense uh, areas uh, in the United States. You would think Alaska would probably be the last place in the United States to have such a high population per 100,000 case rate and hospitalization rate. But for the last month or even slightly more than that, uh, they've literally been on fire uh, with new cases. And that, again, it just says that the virus spreads in small family units. And, uh, you know, in spite of the weather and in spite of uh, the, you know, reasonable rollout of some of the vaccines. There's still quite a few non-vaccinated individuals who are not protecting themselves, not protecting others, not wearing masks, and they're going to continue to get infected and they're going to continue to get hospitalized. And, uh, you know, there's still a lot of non-vaccinated uh, uh, individuals in this country uh, that are very, very susceptible to a highly contagious agent like the Delta variant. Mm. Dr. Gould, the Delta variant has taken a significant toll on the world, even in rural areas like we were just talking about. It has that rapid spread potential. And we've also seen a surge of breakthrough cases. If people don't get vaccinated, is there a higher probability of more mutations of the virus? Well, I think the rule of thumb, Christina, is the more spread of the virus, the higher the rate of mutation. But this is something that Dr. Hendricks has studied for many years, and uh, I'd ask him uh, to weigh in on that question of, you know, the impact of continued spread, not only in our nation, Dr. Hendricks, but, you know, what's going on in parts of the developing world. And that's exactly why we need to work harder to get this under control. It's like rolling the dice. And the more times you roll the dice, you're going to come up snake eyes. So the sooner we get this under control and, and stop rolling the dice, the better it is for all of humankind and now animal kind. Mm. You were hearing reports of this Epsilon variant. What do we know about that right now? So, yes, Epsilon and Mu are the two variants that people are watching most closely right now. 
Uh, you know, and even Delta, you know, we're dealing now with the fourth variety of Delta in the United States. They're very similar, and so they haven't renamed it to a, a different virus, but it is genetically different, and the configuration of the spike protein is somewhat different. Uh, but uh, the mu and the epsilon variants, uh, which we're seeing uh, in the United States in small numbers, but in other parts of the world, such as South America, uh, in larger numbers, do appear to be more contagious and unfortunately do appear to have a, sli a slightly higher propensity uh, for vaccine breakthrough. But again, I'd ask Dr. Henricks, because he, again, studies this uh, extremely uh, closely. Uh, Dr. Henricks, uh, any concerns about the Epsilon or the Mu variants that you're aware of at this time? Well, first of all, I think it's good for the audience to know that the government is doing a very good job uh, supporting the, um, the surveillance for these mutations. And every state in the union has a targeted program. Uh, we are sequ sequencing several hundred uh, isolates uh, on a regular basis. And we have not seen either of the other mutations. Although within Delta, we have seen the mutations you're describing, Dr. Gold. But at this point, we're not seeing any of those other mutations uh, that are of concern. Well, that's some peace of mind for all of us tonight. We're going to go back to the phones now. Jim of Missouri joins the conversation. Thank you for joining us. Jim, go right ahead. Jim? Jay, I'm being told. Jay, are you there? Either way, unfortunately, give us a call back, Jay. We'll try to get your question answered later on tonight. Fred from Arizona has been waiting patiently. Go right ahead, Fred. Yes, uh, I have a question for the doctor. Um, I got fully vaccinated. I got my booster last week, but this friend of mine wants me to visit her, and she hasn't been vaccinated. So do I take the risk of uh, getting the virus if I go visit her? Well, certainly, Fred, your risk because you're fully vaxxed and because you got your booster uh, is definitely going to be far lower. Uh, I would, if you're going to do it, and you know, anytime you do something like that, there is a risk associated with it. Not just in seeing that individual, but in travel, you know, uh, meeting other people, uh, et cetera. So I would wait a good 14 days uh, from the time of your booster shot. Uh, and then, assuming you're otherwise healthy, uh, I'd be pretty comfortable doing it with caution, possibly wearing a mask, uh, et cetera, it's trying to maintain uh, some distance. Uh, you know, just take the usual precautions. If on the other side of the coin, uh, for some reason, you are at higher risk, either because of age uh, or perhaps you have one of those comorbidity conditions we've been talking about uh, advanced diabetes, on high-dose steroids, transplant, uh, cancer, something of that nature. Uh, I think long and hard about being with other people who are not vaccinated right now, particularly uh, in parts of the country, Fred, where the vaccine, where the spread rates are high and the vaccine rates are relatively low. And so if you're in one of those high-risk areas, uh, or if you are a higher risk yourself, uh, I think long and hard about making that trip. Again, uh, if you're concerned, uh, give your health care professional a call and, and get their best advice. All right. Thank you for that call. We appreciate it, Fred. Wendy of Florida is up next. Go right ahead, Wendy. Yes, thank you. Um, I have a question for Dr. Gold. Um, I'm fully vaccinated with Johnson & Johnson. Um, I'm in anticipating getting a booster with Johnson & Johnson, but one of my family members um, was giving me negative feedback about doing so. They were telling me that it's, it's, it's not worth it, um, that I should be using Pfizer or Moderna, um, and she said because it's not as effective. Um, but I don't really want to switch. I would like to stay with Johnson & Johnson. What, what is your thoughts and your feedback on this? So, Wendy, when the uh, Food and Drug Administration reviewed the clinical trials for Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J, uh, &J, Johnson & Johnson, they looked at every possible mix and match consideration. 
So, <clears throat> but Johnson and Johnson following either Pfizer or Moderna, and Pfizer and Moderna following Johnson and Johnson. And what they did was they studied the antibody levels, that is to say, how much antibody you made. And so for individuals that got the J&J &J vaccine, the highest level of antibody production was with the Moderna product. The second highest level was with the Pfizer product. And surprisingly, the third highest level was with a second dose of the J&J &J product. And I think that's what your friend is referring to. However, uh, that is just antibody levels. That doesn't tell you whether or not uh, it, you are completely protected from reinfection, which of course is why you are getting the booster and protected from hospitalization. And there's good reason to believe that all of these products, any combination, will give you a reasonable amount of protection. However, if you wanted to get that vaccine booster that had the highest antibody level, which you know theoretically should have the longest lasting effect, uh, your friend is right, and the uh, mRNA vaccines uh, will give you a higher level. So just to give you a rough idea on the numbers, uh, on a scale of, let's say, uh, 0 to 100 uh, of, of amplification of antibodies, the Moderna product on top of a J&J &J vaccine uh, would give you a 75-fold increase. Uh, the uh, uh, Pfizer would give you approximately a 35, 37-fold increase, and the J&J &J would give you a 5 to 7-fold uh, increase, maybe even slightly less than that, I think 4.86. Uh, was the number, if I'm not mistaken. So again, this is just antibodies. It doesn't equal uh, immunity, uh, but higher the antibodies, likely the more immune you are, likely the longer it's going to last. All right. Thank you for that call, Wendy. Next up is Dave of Pennsylvania. You're on with Dr. Gold. Go right ahead, Dave. Yes, hi. Thanks for taking my call. You have a great show. I watch it all the time. Uh, my question is, uh, why or how is it possible for them to come up with some kind of a cure for for uh, COVID in such a short time uh, without being tested or uh, like other different types of medication that they've used for colds or like uh, years ago? I'm 85 and I've lived through quite a few different, uh, 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 let's say, uh, uh, sicknesses. I've been very, very uh, well blessed with uh, good health all my life, and but I'm, I'm kind of curious as to how they can come up with a cure so quickly, or think they have a cure so quickly, and and know that it's going to do the job and not have reper repercussions. Well, I'll take a shot at your question, Dave, uh, and thanks for calling, by the way, and then we'll ask Dr. Henricks uh, to weigh in as well, but. Uh, so one of the reasons, uh, first of all, there's very good science for both the Merck and the Pfizer uh, antiviral drug that we've been talking about. The reason they were able to develop them so quickly is they looked at drugs that they, molecules that they already had developed, that they had looked at for other viral infections, and they had some idea about safety and efficacy for different infections, and based upon the structure and the, and the way the coronavirus reproduces, they made some uh, scientific estimates as to which of these drugs might be the most effective and then tested them in large clinical trials, you know, in a very significant number of individuals uh, who were infected uh, with COVID. So this, these were not tested in individuals who were not infected. These were tested in individuals uh, who had a positive PCR uh, test for COVID, and it showed a dramatic, dramatic uh, protection against serious illness uh, and hospitalization in both of those uh, uh, new drugs. So, yes, they, they are, uh, you know, tested to be both safe and effective. Dr. Hendricks, do you have anything you want to add to that in terms well, of a the, couple the points. trials? Um, First of all, I think it's important for everybody to know that we've had coronaviruses around a long time. Uh, there are at least seven different uh, strains out there, possibly maybe more, and that the uh, research industry and the academic world has been studying coronaviruses a long time. 
And one of the things that they noticed uh, between uh, this virus and other RNA viruses is that an, a, um, a particular process called protease inhibition could be effective uh, because it's been shown to be effective with other RNA viruses. And so that was a clue that everybody was able to follow early on. And that's what's turned out to be so significant that a protease inhibitor strategy is effective in coronaviruses and SARS in particular. Wow. And that's uh, the characteristic of the, both of these new drugs, as I understand it. They're both protease inhibitors. I'm excited to find out more about these two drugs as the weeks go on. Thank you for that call, and thank you for watching every week, Dave, of Pennsylvania. It means a lot to us to hear that you have been watching. All right, we are going to pause for a quick break, but stay with us. We still have time for your call on the other side of this break. 877-731-6733 is the number to call and join our conversation. Any question that you have, we have the experts standing by. Experts that you won't find anywhere else, only on RFD TV. TV. More Rural Health Matters after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. We are glad that you've joined us tonight. I want to give you the number to call. It's 877-731-6733. Call in with your questions or comments about COVID-19. We always like to hear from you. It gives us a broader perspective of what's happening out there across rural America and what's important to you. One more time, I'm going to give you that number, 877-731-6733. Joining us once again is Dr. Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska. Nebraska Medical Center, and tonight we welcome the Chair of Pathology and Microbiology at UNMC, Dr. Stephen Henricks. You know, some medical experts have predicted that when we do move beyond the pandemic, the spread of COVID will look and feel more like seasonal influenza. Is that the case, or do you think that we'll need to get multiple shots each year to protect ourselves and others for the foreseeable future? Uh, you know, uh, Dr. Hendricks has been studying viruses for a very long time. Uh, I think given the expertise that he has, this would be a really good question for him. Well, happy to uh, take a shot at it, and uh, you're welcome to then see if I answer the question uh, along the lines you thought. Um, in fact, I think influenza is a very good analogy. Uh, we believed early on that we would begin to see an attenuation of the virus. That's yet to be proven but I think that's beginning to be seen, uh, where we have all these individuals who uh, have very uh, little infection or very little disease. Um, then the question becomes of how strong will be the immunity over time. And again, I think the lesson from RNA viruses is in fact, uh, we will have immunity. Whether in fact it'll be six months or, um, or longer, we don't know. But um, again, based on what we've seen from influenza, some people will benefit from a booster and others, uh, it will not be necessary. At least that's my opinion. Interesting. Now, Dr. Henricks, on the same vein, if we do get past this pandemic, could the virus actually be kept alive in animal populations and then come back again? Well, that is exactly the consideration and the concern. So um, you probably already know that influenza uh, does propagate and stays in the circulation, uh, in the uh, duck population, the bird population, even seals, uh, some aquatic animals. And so that is why we were so concerned uh, when we heard that, that humans had now transmitted the virus to animals and to the animal population. Uh, fortunately, it doesn't seem to be in too many uh, wild animals. Although that's why we were concerned about this uh, information we heard from um, uh, the white-tailed deer. That's yet to be fully confirmed and investigated, but that is something that is, needs to be closely followed. And as it is closely followed, based on what you do right, know right now, if I were to go deer hunting or someone in my family was going deer hunting and they harvest a deer, should they be wearing a mask? Is there anything that we should be doing differently? And is it safe to eat? Well, I think, again, uh, the, the deer hunters uh, know that there are other diseases that deer carry, and they should be concerned and watchful of those as well. Um, you know, wasting disease is already out there. It's something they need to be watching. Um, and I would recommend and highly encourage them to make sure if, they, if the game wardens in their area are asked or are willing to test the animal, uh, let them go ahead and have some blood and have some testing. In regards to masks, 
uh, a mask may be appropriate for any number of organisms that uh, are out there in the wild while they're doing the, the, uh, the, the harvest and the, and the cleaning. So that may be very appropriate for any number of reasons and not just COVID. Uh, but personally, I'm not that concerned about this particular population of animals. Um, I'm much more concerned about animals where we already know that uh, COVID replicates very highly, as I mentioned earlier, particularly in the mink population. Fascinating how the mink population is, is seeing the transmission rates that it is. Very strange to me. <laughs> I'm sure many of you out there as well. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. John from Wyoming has a question. Go right ahead, John. Uh, my question is, earlier in the program tonight, a caller asked uh, that they had had the, I believe, J&J &J, um, vaccine and want to know which one to follow up. And Dr. Gold gave some numbers. In our case, we have two uh, doses of the Moderna, and we're wondering which vaccine would perhaps offer us the best opportunity. Sure. So uh, similarly, out of the mix and match trial, John, uh, where an individual received either the uh, Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine as their primary sequence, uh, and by the way, you're now six months out from that as opposed to two months out from the J&J, &J, uh, you will be benefited uh, well uh, from uh, either the Pfizer or the Moderna in, in follow-up. Uh, the Moderna showed a slightly higher uh, antibody level following uh, either of those, but uh, nowhere near as striking a distance uh, as we saw uh, with the J&J &J, uh, primary uh, round of vaccine. Don't forget, the J&J &J was a single-dose vaccine. It was constructed that way uh, because it was thought that there'd be a significant population uh, that didn't want to go through the complexity of having to come back and get a second dose and, you know, lose time from work or school or, or things of that nature. So uh, uh, so uh, it, I would say uh, it, it probably matters very little and take whichever one uh, you can get. So if you got the Moderna and you had a, you know, reasonable response to it, uh, didn't get terribly symptomatic uh, after your second dose, then, you know, I think most people would say go with what you know. And indeed, you know, if you go back to the graphics that we showed a bit earlier, most people who got the Moderna, 95% of them, are selecting uh, the Moderna, as you see here in green. Those people that started with the Pfizer, 98% uh, have selected Pfizer. Dr. Gold, I think you're making a very important point for people, uh, particularly back to Wendy. Uh, so if you've already had the vaccine and you did not have a, a reaction, um, and or even had the second and did not have a reaction and therefore you feel more comfortable with that, by all means, that's enough reason to so-called break the tie and continue on with that vaccine. Absolutely. I love that graphic as well. It really tells a story. Okay, we are going to Oklahoma. Marion has a question tonight. You're up, Marion. Go right ahead. Well, good evening. Um, I'm questioning the booster. Now, my husband and I both got the Moderna booster. We had originally gotten the Moderna vaccines. And my question is, with his health, they gave him a full dose booster. But for me, they gave me just a half dose. So am I as protected as him? I don't know why they do half and whole. Sure. Well, so Marion, that, that is the difference with just the Moderna uh, sequence. And for those individuals that had a full cycle, that is to say two doses of Moderna, who are uh, below, either below the age of 65 or are otherwise healthy, meaning they don't have one of the immune complex diseases, uh, haven't had an organ transplant, not being treated for cancer, not on medication that blunts your immune system response, you need 50 milligrams, the half dose of the vaccine. However, for those individuals that are either older or those individuals that have had other medical problems or being treated for a medical condition with a medication that lowers your immune system response, uh, the Food and Drug Administration and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommended not what we're calling a booster, but what we're calling a third dose, which would be the full dose of the Moderna vaccine or the 100 microgram dose. 
Uh, it may sound a little nuanced, a little uh, complex, but it sounds like somebody made a wise decision for you and a wise decision uh, for your husband. And so theoretically, if you just look at the data that was submitted by uh, Moderna to the Food and Drug Administration, you're both well protected. All right. Thank you for that call. I think our last call tonight will be Roger of Montana. Thanks for your patience. Roger, go right ahead. Yes, I'm wanting all about ivermectin, you know. Sure. Well, Roger, we've talked a bit about that previously, but let's uh, review at least what I know about it now. There have been a number of really good quality clinical studies that have shown uh, that it really doesn't help. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, there have been anecdotal examples of people that were treated with it. Unfortunately, there have been anecdotal examples of people that took veterinary quantities of it and had a lot of serious side effects as a result of those veterinary quantities that had a call poison control and, and others uh, as well. But even if it's prescribed in the, in the human dose, uh, the data is at best uh, anecdotal. And it's not to say that someday somebody may not do a scientific study uh, that shows some advantage at some stage of, uh, of COVID, but either treat it early treat it upon symptomatic uh, changing or treat it during severe COVID. And those studies have been done with and without other medications, ivermectin alone. Uh, and they just haven't shown a uh, benefit and they have shown some risk uh, to the patient. And so right now, you know, as we've talked about, there are these two new oral medications that are just around the corner. Uh, there are these wonderful monoclonal antibodies, which can be absolutely life-saving. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, that's really what the science shows. And, you know, as we've tried so hard uh, to stay really based on the science. All right. What a great show. We had so many fantastic calls tonight. I want to thank you for joining us. Now, before we say goodbye, we wanted to share some good news coming out of the hospital. The RFD TV family has a brand new member. This is Sylvan Patrick Gotch, born just hours ago to parents Gatsby and David Solheim. Now, Gatsby is a leader and serves as general counsel with Rural Media Group. And Sylvan is the first grandson of RFD TV founder Patrick Gotch. And you can see the proud mama there. Patrick has a lot of girls in his life, so this is going to be very exciting for him. Congratulations, Gatsby. You look just beautiful in that picture there. And we want to thank you again for joining us tonight right here on Rural Health Matters. UNMC Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold, Dr. Stephen Henricks, you can come back anytime. We love the information you bring to the table here. You're such a joy to have on our show. Now, if we didn't get to your question tonight, you can get it answered on a voice recording. Our hotline number is 855-776-6147. If you don't like the way you asked it the first time, you hang up, you call back and do it over and we will get your question answered. Remember, we're here for you every single Monday at 6 Eastern, 5 Central, only on RFD TV. We encourage you to call in with your questions. It's always a great opportunity to learn more about the virus as well. And for those of you who've been watching with us over the past year, we wanna thank you for coming back every single Monday night. Again, that number is 855-776-6147. We'll see you next week.